So these are the new digs on Alex. New office. It's been a great setup. We have responsibility to produce all the data, we truly generate the data necessary to fuel this next era. What worked before is not going to keep working. Our responsibility is to utilize the exact same infrastructure and data foundry that we've built to support every enterprise in their own journey to make use of all of their proprietary data towards building customized, specialized agents for their own businesses. You must still do a lot of college recruiting, right? I mean, when I obviously I dropped out to start the company, so yeah. I have a strong conviction in um, talent right out of college. We have an office in New York, an office in uh, DC, uh, we just started an office in London. No, oh, that's amazing. Thank you very much. You were sort of born in the AI era. So where do you think we are in the development of this? Are, are we getting to the stage where, you know, it's musical chairs are done, we know who the main players are, this game is over, or, you know, are we in the first inning, the third inning? Are we, you know, getting settled into it? To me, the first inning was sort of the uh, tinkering phase of uh, modern deep learning. Yeah. So um, from ImageNet uh, and uh, AlexNet, so ImageNet was the first large-scale image labeled image data set. AlexNet was the um, the very first use of deep neural networks to solve that problem. There was like the Google result where they could recognize cats in YouTube videos. Um, all of that was sort of, you know, basically like call it 2009 through uh, really probably 20, 20 yeah. um, was was the first inning. And you know, while it was quite a while, it was really a lot of tinkering uh, with different kinds of model architectures, different kinds of data sets. It, it was the first demonstration that showed that scaling these models up um, really worked. A lot of the progress from GPT-2 through GPT-4 was all in pre-training, was all training on, you know, more bigger and bigger chunks of the internet on more and more GPUs. And then basically all of the gains from that point, which was, you know, March of last year yeah. through today, um, you know, August of 2024, have been through uh, gains in, in post-training. Yeah. Um, and uh, this is through better SFT, RLHF, DPO um, of the models and the use of, you know, data sets of increasing uh, complexity, uh, in, you know, going into more and more expert areas and really driving for the performance of the models using high, you know, quality over quantity. So smaller yeah. data sets, but a very, very high quality. Yeah. Now you're actually creating effectively data sets that are unique to the explicit purpose that the model maker wants, right? Exactly, yeah. So we think about us, our, our role now as more of a data foundry um, than, a, uh, than a data annotator. The industry is very, very excited about agents. Yeah. You know, there's very little data that can train these models of what are the series of actions that a human takes and what is their internal thought process as they go through each of those steps. Mm -hmm. We actually view one of our most important roles, especially over the next few years, is to uh, lay the groundwork for agents to actually become a possibility yeah. um, in the industry. I'm guessing that the biggest opportunity for agents is actually more in the enterprise space and that uh, enterprises are going, to need, are going to need very specific kinds of agents to do the work that they do. So what does that mean for scale in terms of uh, developing your business over onto the enterprise side? Our responsibility is to utilize the exact same infrastructure and data foundry that we've built to support these large AGI efforts to support every enterprise in their own journey to make use of all of their proprietary data towards building you know, customized, specialized agents for their own businesses. Yeah. So where we see a lot of enterprises struggle today is in the jump from pilot to production. Is your pilot model good enough to actually ship to production? And then if it isn't good enough, um, if it's good enough, great, deploy it and continue monitoring. And if it isn't good enough, uh, aiding in the process of uh, tuning the model or improving the model with proprietary data or with new data to get to that point of production. I know one of the topics that you are pretty passionate and talk about is AI safety. There's obviously the ongoing debate between, you know, sort of unleashing through open source. Where do you think that all lands? And maybe talk also about this in the context of sovereign nations and how that plays out and the importance of this in terms of, you know, the uh, 
the democratic nations being able to keep keep uh, keep our universe more or less the way it is. I think over the next few years, it will become more and more obvious that these models are powerful and that we need to be thoughtful about um, what the what their capabilities are. And I think even today, we already see some of that with disinformation campaigns yeah. um, powered by AI. If you look through the history of tense geopolitical situations or wars writ large, um, technology plays an incredibly key role. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, there's no technology more important today than AI in terms of its ability to uh, fundamentally shape how this all plays out. There was always this never ending conflict between the good guys and the bad guys. Each would um, reassess and understand the new context under which they were competing with each other, use the latest and greatest tools, and then attempt to outcompete with each other. How realistic is it to think that the bad guys will be prevented from access versus a reality of we just have to be constantly, the good guys have to be just constantly ahead in terms of innovation, technological development, et cetera, et cetera. I think you're right. You know, some of that may change now. The export controls of high-end chips to China is, is quite um, draconian and, and could, could start causing more divergence. But um, to your point, I think it's unrealistic to believe that we could ever have a, a huge gap in capability between, um, between the good guys and the bad guys. But it's also our responsibility as a nation, I think the United States as a nation, to figure out how we ensure that lead is as, as great as yeah. possible. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense. We just gotta stay ahead. Yeah. And then I think it's, uh, you know, the, one of the, AI safety is such, an, is such a strange topic, but my core, my, my true belief is that um, if the United States maintains leadership in AI, you avoid a lot of the most devastating scenarios of AI safety. Would you say that there's a sufficient amount of awareness and preparedness for what's about to happen? And is there the level of investments that necessary for us, for the good guys to stay ahead? The total investment from tech giants into AI programs will exceed the entire U.S. defense budget at some point, you know, mm. in the next however many years. Um, the where so that I think is a bullish sign for America. Where we're not seeing the investment is actually from the U.S. government itself, and and um, and so I think it's a very real scenario where in the commercial sector we have we have exquisite AI capabilities, but none of that tech translates to um, military or national security advantages that enable us to prevent all these really bad outcomes. Just as a simple example, you know, the United States on uh, data and AI, the United States Department of Defense on data and AI invests, you know, depending on how you count it, uh, three to 10 times less than the, hmm. the uh, Chinese People Liberations Army, so the, the PLA out of China. So um, we are, as a portfolio, dramatically underinvested compared to China, which is you know, the second largest defense budget in the world. And, um, and there's a lot of talk around defense modernization and how we like innovate on defense procurement. You know, these are very common conversations in the DOD, but my concern is it look, we're just not moving fast enough on it. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess, Alex, in some sense, even for a company, an organism like Scale, the thing that was the biggest differentiator was data. Data is what's allowed you to become an amazing company and differentiate from everything that's out there and find all the new things. It's a, it's a, it's a great learning of, of humanity that uh, better data results in better AI. So, um, yeah. Or real eye. <laughs> or real, or real eye. <laughs> awesome, Alex, really appreciate the time. Yeah, thanks for checking out our new digs. Yeah, super exciting. Can't wait for how, how this is gonna turn out over the next couple of years.